I stood in front of 28 of the greatest minds in physics, Niels Bohr, Paul Dirac, Robert Oppenheimer himself, and I failed. Not a small failure. A complete disaster. My presentation fell apart. My ideas were rejected. Oppenheimer looked at me like I had wasted everyone's time. I went home to Cornell, and I couldn't work. For weeks, I felt like my career was over before it had really begun. But then a young British mathematician did something I didn't expect. He saw what Oppenheimer couldn't see. He understood what Bohr refused to understand. And he saved my life's work. It was March 1948 at the Pocono Manor Inn in Pennsylvania. Oppenheimer had organized this conference to address the biggest crisis in physics. We were trying to understand how light and matter interact at the quantum level. The problem was that our equations kept giving us infinite answers. Nonsense. Something was deeply wrong. I had been working on this problem for years. At Los Alamos, while we were building the bomb, I was also building something else in my mind. A new way to visualize these interactions. Little pictures. Diagrams. But first, Julian Schwinger took the stage. Schwinger was everything I was not. Elegant and formal. He lectured for eight hours straight without notes filling blackboard after blackboard with beautiful mathematics. The audience was mesmerized. Oppenheimer nodded approvingly. Then it was my turn. I showed them my diagrams. They were simple drawings, lines and squiggles representing particles moving through space and time. To me, they were obvious, and they made the physics clear. But Bohr stood up. He said my positrons traveling backward in time violated the uncertainty principle. I tried to explain that the diagrams were not meant to be taken literally. They were a tool for calculation. He did not understand. Dirac raised objections. Teller interrupted. The more I tried to explain, the worse it became. The talk just fizzled out. At the end of the conference, Schwinger was the hero. His mathematics was the future, and Oppenheimer, the most powerful man in American physics, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, had made up his mind. He was thoroughly impressed by Schwinger and thoroughly disappointed by me. I drove back to Cornell in silence. I couldn't sleep. I kept replaying the disaster in my head. Maybe my diagrams were wrong. Maybe I had fooled myself into thinking I had discovered something important. A few months earlier, a young Englishman had arrived at Cornell. His name was Freeman Dyson. He was 24 years old, a mathematician from Cambridge. The first time he saw me, he wrote to his parents in England. He called me half genius and half buffoon. I can't blame him. I was running around campus, playing bongos, cracking jokes, getting into trouble. I probably looked like I didn't take anything seriously. But Dyson was watching me carefully. He came to my lectures. He listened to my ideas. And slowly, he began to realize something that even I didn't fully appreciate. My diagrams weren't just pictures. They were a completely new way of doing physics. In June 1948, I was driving from Cleveland to Albuquerque. I had a girl waiting for me in New Mexico. Dyson needed to get to Michigan for a summer school, so I offered him a ride. Four days, 1,800 miles, just the two of us in my car, crossing America. We talked about everything. Physics, of course, my diagrams, his mathematics, but also about life, about my wife Arlene, who had died three years earlier from tuberculosis, about my time at Los Alamos, about the strange feeling of having helped build something so terrible. In Oklahoma, we got caught in a massive rainstorm. Every hotel was full. The only place with a room was, well, let us just say it was not the kind of place you would bring your mother. We spent the night there, talking about quantum electrodynamics in a room that charged by the hour. When we finally reached Albuquerque, I was so excited to see my girl that I did not notice the speed limit signs. We were driving 70 miles per hour in a 20 miles per hour zone. We got pulled over. We had to pay a fine in a New Mexico courthouse. Dyson continued on to Michigan, where he spent six weeks studying with Schwinger, my rival, the man whose mathematics everyone understood and admired. If you want to learn more about the people who changed my life, Subscribe to this channel. I tell stories about the greatest minds in physics and the moments that made history. In September 1948, 
Freeman Dyson was on a Greyhound bus traveling from San Francisco to Princeton. He had spent months absorbing my ideas and Schwinger's ideas, two completely different approaches to the same problem. Everyone thought they were incompatible. Even Schwinger and I could not understand each other's methods. 48 hours on that bus, the endless plains of Nebraska rolling past the window. Dyson was exhausted, half asleep. And then, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, it happened. A flash of illumination, he called it. Suddenly, he saw it. My diagrams and Schwinger's equations were not different theories at all. They were the same theory, written in different languages. He had cracked the code. When Dyson arrived at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, he knew he had something important. But there was a problem. Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was the director, and Oppenheimer still thought my entire approach was fundamentally wrong. He had said publicly that the whole program I was working on was a dead end. Dyson had to convince him otherwise. It was not easy. Oppenheimer was notoriously tough in seminars. He would interrupt speakers, tell them they were talking nonsense, and cut them off mid-sentence. And that is exactly what happened to Dyson. Week after week, he presented his ideas. And week after week, Oppenheimer attacked him. It was brutal. Dyson was brought to the edge of despair. But he did not give up. Finally, my old friend Hans Beth came down from Cornell. Beth was one of the few people Oppenheimer respected. He sat through Dyson's presentation, and then he took Oppenheimer aside. Whatever Beth said, it worked. The next morning, Dyson found a small piece of paper in his mailbox. Two words in Oppenheimer's handwriting. No lo contendere. R.O. No contest. Oppenheimer had surrendered. Dyson published his paper in 1949, The Radiation Theories of Tomonaga Schwinger and Feynman. It was one of the longest papers the Physical Review had ever published, and it changed everything. For the first time, physicists could see that our three different approaches were really one unified theory. And Dyson showed them something else. My diagrams were not just a curiosity. They were easier to use than Schwinger's complicated mathematics. They were more intuitive more powerful. Within a year, physicists everywhere were using Feynman diagrams. The method that Oppenheimer had dismissed, that Bohr had rejected, that the entire establishment had failed to understand, became the standard tool of particle physics. I finally wrote up my ideas, a series of papers in 1948, 1949, and 1950. But honestly, if Dyson had not written his paper first, if he had not fought for my work when I could not, those ideas might have stayed locked inside my head. He gave my diagrams to the world. In 1965, I stood in Stockholm to receive the Nobel Prize in Physics. I shared it with Julian Schwinger and Sinitiro Tomonaga. Freeman Dyson was not included. Some people thought that was unfair. He had done the work that connected us all. But Dyson never complained. He told me once that he was happy with how things turned out. He had his own path to follow. Dyson went on to do extraordinary things. Nuclear rockets, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and of course, the Dyson Sphere, a concept so wild that it became part of science fiction forever. I will always remember him as the 24-year-old kid on that Greyhound bus, the one who saw what nobody else could see. Oppenheimer was one of the greatest physicists of his generation. He led the Manhattan Project. He shaped the future of American science. But on that day in March, 1948, he was wrong about me. And it took a young man from England riding alone on a bus through Nebraska to prove it. Sometimes the people who change your life are not the ones you expect. They are not the famous names or the powerful voices. They are the quiet ones who watch carefully, think deeply, and have the courage to say yes when everyone else says no. Freeman Dyson said yes. And that made all the difference. If this story moved you, leave a like and subscribe to this channel. Every week I share a new story about the people who changed physics and the moments that made them human.